I've been following uh, Jeff Mano's building blog for, uh, I don't know, as, as long as it's been around, as near as I could tell. I mean, I'm an infrastructure nerd. Pretty much every picture I take on vacation is of sewer pipes and, um, you know, water systems or um, all these kind of things. I, I'm always paying attention to infrastructure. And uh, so the, you know, the building blog has been you know, the place that has turned me on to other things and then, and, uh, and really kind of le leapfrogged me around the internet around my uh, infrastructure obsession. So uh, when, he uh, came out with this book around uh, relooking at architecture from the other user's point of view. Um, it really struck me, and I, and I had recently taken uh, a class on uh, lock picking from someone who appears in the book, or is at least credited in the book, Eric. Um, and when when I first picked when I picked my very first lock, it changed the way I looked at the entire world. Uh, and like locks changed from a thing that were this impenetrable barrier to, it was just, a, it's, a, it's a time equation. And fundamentally this book um, about a burglar's guide to the city is about changing the way that a, a different perspective on the city. And I think um, in there, there's the, the one user group is uh, of the burglars in the 1990s in, uh, in LA, there was a burglary every 45 minutes of every work day, was that right? So 1990s, 45 minutes of every work day in LA, there was just in the LA area, there was a, a bank robbery going on. So I mean, it's like, I mean, there's a whole population of people that were, um, that were using architecture and using um, the systems that we had built in a very, very different way. Um, and so, um, you know, with tools as simple as, as these that you can make at home, all of a sudden people could enter into things. Most crimes are crimes of opportunity, but Jeff has really dove into the parts of crime that were pre-planned and that used architecture almost as a weapon against itself. And so um, we're looking forward to this talk. Welcome, Jeff. Enjoy. Cool. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for spending your Valentine's Day evening uh, talking about burglary and bank crime and um, the long-term effects of, of security architecture. It's a very romantic thing to do. Uh, it's, also, it's nice to be back in San Francisco as well. Um, I, I, my wife and I lived here about 10 years ago, and uh, it's always nice to come back and explore different neighborhoods, so, um, so it's, it's good to be here. Um, so. Uh, as as uh, Xander mentioned, I'll, I'll basically be talking about, uh, what are we looking at here? That's me. Okay, so I'll basically be just talking about some of the um, people and stories from the book um, that I wrote, A Burglar's Guide, that came out um, in the middle of last year uh, to really kind of introduce uh, uh, many concepts about what exactly is burglary, what is its relationship to architecture, why would someone who's interested in architecture be interested in burglary, um, you know, uh, whether or not burglary is the same thing as theft. There are a lot of things that we'll, we'll be talking about and looking at. Um, but I wanted to just give a brief um, uh, note about, you know, exactly where I'm coming from in this. So as an architecture and design writer, um, you know, the thing that really struck out to me about burglary and what drew me to it is that burglary is, uh, it's, it's very specifically an architectural crime. Um, so burglary cannot exist without the built environment. It's not the same thing as theft. Uh, in fact, uh, you can be a burglar for your entire life and never steal anything. And you can also steal things for your entire life uh, and not be a burglar. Um, so any felony or the uh, conspiracy or intention to commit one inside an architectural space in which you don't have permission to be can be legally considered burglary. And so that has a lot of really interesting and strange um, implications as, as I'll be discussing over the next half hour or so, and as we can get into with questions at the end, um, which, would, which would be, I, I would encourage you to, to have some of you, uh, I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, but so I really wanted to dive into that notion that burglary and architecture were legally connected, but also very conceptually connected. And so um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, is actually the title of the talk, which is the notion of breaking the close. And so what's fascinating about burglary is that it even legally redefines uh, w where architecture begins and ends. And so um, it may seem, you know, it's even a kind of a, 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 an eye-rolling uh, joke in a lot of architecture schools where, you know, whether or not we truly understand the difference between inside and outside, um, whether or not uh, we actually can make that distinction. 
Um, but what's interesting about burglary is that it actually does call that, that distinction between inside and outside into, into, in, into question. Um, and that's this thing called the close, which is this invisible line with, that uh, uh, exists, uh, surrounds objects in a kind of, um, you know, I, could, I might describe it as a kind of legal crystallography. Um, it's a series of invisible planes that defines inside and outside. And so think about, so a couple examples here would be, think about a, a convertible car parked on the street with its top down. Um, think about a house with a uh, screened-in porch where there are no screens on the, uh, uh, installed on, on the porch on a particular day. Um, think about your own home or apartment, but the, win the windows are open or the um, uh, front door is open. Um, there may not physically be a surface that, that differentiates one side from another, the public world from the private world. Um, but nonetheless, there is a legally recognizable surface called the close. And the close, of course, is not clothing, but the close is enclosing a door or an enclosure. Um, that, that maintains that, that, that fiction of, of inside and outside. And so that might, necessarily, might not necessarily sound particularly uh, interesting. Uh, it's very abstract. But what's um, pretty shocking about this, actually, is the extent to which burglary can be attached to things based on minuscule crossings of an invisible barrier that basically only lawyers can see. Um, so a good example of that was a case where an individual uh, came up to a home and was threatening the homeowner. Um, the threat in this case is a felony, and as this individual did so, he leaned against the front of the house. There was a, on the windowsill, the window was open, and the tips of his fingers crossed the invisible line from outside to inside. Um, in tandem with threatening the homeowner, that was enough to get this guy nabbed for burglary. So the tips of his fingers broke the clothes, and that constituted physical entrance into a, into a space. Um, you may recall actually an interesting um, thing in New York City, maybe three or four years ago, where um, uh, as an art project, um, these Two individuals replaced the American flags with white flags, like surrender flags. Um, it was interesting li listening to the police uh, actually kind of, um, you know, grind their teeth and fantasize about the kinds of things they could charge these guys with. Um, but one of them was burglary. Uh, well, so interestingly enough, it was because of the fact that in order to get to the top of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is obviously 100% outside in any layman's understanding of the Brooklyn Bridge, um, they had to go over a fence and into a, a kind of fenced-in area that from the point of view of the law could be considered an internal space that they broke into with the intention of committing a crime of both vandalism and trespassing and any other things they wanted to throw. And so that was an act of burglary in uh, plain air. So you can imagine, in other words, a whole series of um, kind of a malign architectural interventions on private property here in San Francisco or on corporate property in a city like Manhattan where uh, small, um, almost imperceptible additions to the facade of a building could be used legally to entrap people in burglary without realizing that they've in fact stepped inside of something. Um, so briefly again, I just want to mention that the other thing that this does is that it also gives um, I kind of compare it to almost like an augmentation spell. So if you have done a certain crime, whether it's a, a violent crime or a crime of drug possession or a handgun or that kind of thing, um, it's a very good way to simply uh, extend a sentence that would otherwise have been um, much shorter or to nab someone because you couldn't get them for the crime they were actually doing, uh, but you can get them for burglary simply by dint of the fact that it occurred within an architectural space that they didn't have permission to be in. And so it's a very interesting crime. It's, it's added on to things and um, has that peculiar relationship to inside and outside. Um, and so while kind of diving into the uh, rabbit hole, I guess you could say, of burglary and its relationship to architecture, um, you can see that you know, over centuries, in fact, the way that burglars look at the built environment has been treated almost, on, in, in almost like semi-mystical terms. Um, while the infographic that you're looking at, which is about a century old, um, doesn't necessarily have a tone of mysticism to it. What I think is so interesting about this is that the implication of an infographic like this is that burglars are looking at buildings differently, that they are getting into your house in physical ways that you yourself have not anticipated, um, that they have figured out a way to solve the puzzle of architecture that uh, wasn't uh, available to you or to other homeowners, and that they have a, a way of getting inside buildings that you might, in fact, need an explanatory infographic to explain. Um, and so. I, I really like this notion that burglars have figured out something about cities or the built environment that, that um, is not uh, uh, common knowledge and that in fact needs this level of explanation. And so in diving into how, other, how people use architecture, I got really fascinated by the fact that you know, it's easy to take for granted that you're supposed to use doors to get from one room to the next. You're supposed to go down a corridor to make it through a building. Um, you're meant to use the streets outside to get from one building to the next. 
Uh, but burglars find a way of uh, deliberately avoiding doors. They'll cut a hole through a wall. They might even avoid the wall and cut a hole through the floor or the ceiling. They might avoid floors and ceilings and cut through roofs or come up uh, from the sewer network beneath the city, an example that um, I'll come back to in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, but so this relationship to architecture is one in which um, I suppose you could describe it almost as a kind of topological relationship in that um, it's a more engaged three-dimensional interaction with architectural space than the ones that we limit ourselves to, or I'll speak for myself, the one that I limit myself to um, as a law-abiding user of architecture. Um, you know, I follow what the architects laid out for me by going through doors. Um, I don't crawl through windows very often, and I tend not to use a concrete coring machine to get to the next floor. Um, but this is something that burglars will do. Um, so a couple just quick examples um, that I go into more length in the book. Um, you know, this can be either an ingenious act of almost revelatory uh, architectural short-circuiting, uh, such as a guy, this individual named Bill Mason, who at one point was robbing a, a mob-connected hotel outside Cleveland, which sounds like a good idea. And uh, he, he wanted to get into the cash room, but it was heavily guarded. So he had a re the realization that the way the hotel was built, he could in fact just break into the hotel room next to the office, go into the closet, cut a hole through the drywall, no one's, you know, they're not protecting the walls from within, go into the cash room, steal whatever he wanted to, and then leave out of a door of his own making, as he referred to it, um, like a kind of pop-up entryway th through, through the world of architecture. Um, those examples are obviously, a, 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 there are many examples like that in, in, the, in the world of architecture as the, as the book goes into, or the world of burglary. Um, but then on the flip side of that, there are people who, uh, in trying to second guess architecture, um, it doesn't go quite as well. Um, so uh, one example uh, was a, this, this kid who I still kind of feel bad for, but uh, in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, decided in the middle of the night to break into a veterinarian's office. Um, but instead of going through the front door, which would have been too easy, or even going through the window, which made too much sense, um, he went up to the roof, um, cut a hole into the HVAC system, and uh, then proceeded to remove all of his clothing, um, I think under the impression that that would uh, reduce friction, and um, slip into the air conditioning duct in order to get some painkillers down below. Um, but in this kind of... Uh, you know, in the book, I compare it to a surreal nudist remake of Die Hard. Um, <laughs> And in, in his nudity, uh, get, he get, got trapped. Uh, was, well, he had a flashlight in one hand and a hammer in the other. Uh, and in trying to get out of the air duct, I was making so much noise that when the people showed up six or seven hours later, um, they actually thought an animal had been trapped inside the air duct, and he had to be removed by the fire department. Um, but so those, those kinds of examples um, are, are pretty shockingly common. Um, you find that uh, burglars, in trying to rethink the notion of a getaway, um, there's one great example in New Zealand where somebody broke into a house and then uh, it tried to get away um, by actually going further into the house. So he crawled up into the ceiling and then somewhat incredibly uh, his toe was sticking out of the ceiling insulation and the police spotted this body part from nowhere um, coming down from the ceiling tiles and pulled him uh, down and arrested him. Um, there are a lot of examples of people trying to hide inside walls to get away, uh, to cut their way deeper and deeper into buildings and have to call, the, call 911 themselves in order to get out. Um, so what I'm getting at is that for every uh, intelligent or exciting misuse of architecture, there are these weird sort of dead end misuses of architecture um, that don't quite go as planned. Um, but so what also I like about that image is that, you know, you, and you see this even in police reports where when someone breaks into a building, um, and these are just kind of eye candy images in the background, but when you see someone break in, um, you know, first you see an arm come through a pet door, or you see a leg come through the cash deposit chute, or you see a head pop out of an HVAC system, or you see someone's toe sticking out of the, uh, the ceiling insulation. Um, burglars have this very peculiar relationship to the in built environment in that they are almost passing through it like ghosts, or I sometimes compare it to um, the creatures in Eb Edwin Abbott's book, Flatland, um, which are these higher dimensional objects moving through hours, and they are seen uh, according to shapes that we can recognize. Um, there are these ghostly body parts that are, sort of appear in our world, but they're not supernatural, they're burglars. Um, and so it really became interesting to me as, again, someone who writes about architecture and design that these people exist out there, that they are thinking so differently about how to get from one room to the next or one building to the next, that they will repurpose tools that are used for um, working on automobiles or demolishing buildings and put that, use those as almost uh, skeleton keys to get, to get inside of, uh, of buildings. And, and we'll return to some of these questions of, of tools um, later on this evening. 
Um, but what I wanted to do is focus on a, 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 an example to hopefully ground some of this, but also show the, the true creativity that I think exists amongst burglars, uh, and also a relatively, um, uh, uh, I, I, what I hope is a good example for um, many people in, in the audience here, which is uh, an individual named Jack Daxwin, um, who got in touch with me actually through um, having heard through word of mouth from some friends of his in the security field that I was work, writing, on a book, uh, writing a book about burglary. Um, so his name is not Jack Daxman, it was a pseudonym, and uh, he actually works now in the security industry, and his current employer doesn't know that he used to be a burglar, or used to be a burglar. Um, it, it, it wasn't immediately clear from the conversation that he had actually given, given up. Uh, he was, he was pretty, pretty enthusiastic about the things he was talking about. Um, <laughs> But so among many, many things that he discussed, that all of which uh, you know, would, would, uh, I could go into great length about, um, there were two things I wanted to discuss. One was that his relationship to architecture was so granular and specific that in order to uh, you know, break into whether it was a high-rise apartment or uh, an office building in Toronto, um, he would actually go through, uh, jump through a lot of hoops to get a hold of construction information. So he would do things as, as simple as go to online resources for the construction industry to try to find exactly what had been used in the construction of a building um, so that he could know what the walls were made out of so he could bring the appropriate tools or even know how loud it was going to be as he cut from one room to the next. Would people hear him doing it? Uh, what grade of concrete was it? Maybe it was only drywall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he would go to the point of actually form, he formed a fake legal company with a business card and would pretend to be involved in lawsuits in order to get uh, floor plans of buildings that he claimed to have an apartment in where there had been a leak. Um, but the example I want to focus on um, this evening is that, um, and again, these are fire insurance maps. Uh, they're just eye candy. They actually are not um, directly relevant to what I'm about to discuss, but they are thematically relevant and also quite nice to look at. Um, but so, was that the fire code of Toronto, um, you know, which of course exists to protect uh, you and I, to protect the people who live there, to uh, make sure that you don't die in an inferno, um, that you can get out of a building safely and that the fire crews can find you. Um, there's, there are other ways of looking at that fire code. And so for Jack Daxwin, what he had realized was that if you take it at its word and you realize that the fire code of Toronto is so detailed and so rigorously applied across the city, um, by memorizing it and understanding exactly what it demanded of the built world, he was able to determine from the outside of a building that he had never set foot in, uh, really, really detailed and accurate uh, estimates of the layout of the building without ever setting foot inside of it. So things like the distance between the door of an apartment to the fire escapes, that, or excuse me, the emergency fire stairs that might exist inside is mandated by law, and so therefore you can start piecing together the floor plan for, for uh, individual floors and choose which apartment you might want to rob. Um, the, no, the floor that would have an alarmed fire escape door uh, inside so that he would deliberately choose the ones that weren't alarmed so that if he had to flee at, at a moment's notice, he could take that door and leave. Um, there's something really fascinating, I think, about this notion that uh, the literal code of the city, um, you know, this otherwise extremely dry thing that, it, again, to speak for myself, I spend zero time thinking about, um, can in fact become this really sophisticated targeting mechanism for somebody with nefarious goals in mind um, is something that I think is a great example of the kind of dual use that burglars put the, the, the built environment to, um, including some, um, some things that we'll look at later. But I love this notion that this thing built to protect us, uh, to help the city be designed in a way that benefits all of us, can in the right or perhaps the wrong hands turn into something that endangers everyone and allows people to choose the, the buildings that they might break into uh, without uh, any kind of hands-on knowledge of that. But so that notion of misuse is something that we'll, we'll see a lot. Um, you know, it's actually just funny, but, um, Xander was showing the, the lock picking tools a couple minutes ago. And um, uh, when I was studying lock picking as well while writing the book, it was really interesting to hear about um, some of the tensioning tools and some of the things that you use to pick padlocks and, and, and door locks and whatnot. Um, actually have very mundane origins that were surprising to me. So one, for example, are the street cleaning bristles on, on trucks, um, the ones that zoom down the street and just basically put all of the debris into the air. Um, and when, those, when those bristles come off, uh, you know, there are, are lock picking crews who kind of religiously follow these street cleaning trucks around to pick up the, 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 uh, the meta metallic bristles and turn them into tensioning tools, or even the underwires and um, women's bras are apparently ideally suited for bending and then using to insert into padlocks. But so I love this notion that we are, first of all, that there are kind of skeleton keys hiding in plain sight that it's up to us to assemble, um, but that also that if through the clever misuse of the built or the everyday environment, 
um, we can find access to um, parts of the world that are not intended for us. So now let's say um, you can take that insight of Jack Daxman and the fire code. Um, you know, what else could be done with that sort of thing? So now let's scale that up to an almost delirious extent. And now imagine instead of the fire code, it's the actual stormwater network for the entire city of Los Angeles. Um, again, Xander mentioned some of this in the, in the beginning, but um, Los Angeles is a really interesting test case. It's a kind of coliseum of bank crime. Um, in the late 1980s and 90s, it, 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 as Xander mentioned, it was, the, was the bank robbery capital of the world. Um, there was that, the, that statistic of a bank robbery every 45 minutes of every workday is um, not only accurate, but is mind boggling. Um, that's so many banks being robbed. Uh, and one of the, there are many, many factors into what went into this uh, rash of bank crime in Los Angeles in the, in the era. Um, but one of the explanations, and something I think is quite interesting in terms of misuse, is that um, there was this phenomenon known as a stop and rob. And so a stop and rob is a financial institution, a bank, a credit union, that kind of thing, that's built at the bottom of an off-ramp and at the bottom of an on-ramp. So you can stop and rob get back on the freeway and, and, and you know, be in Burbank and 20 minutes later, uh, traffic depending. <laughs> but so the notion then that of course the transportation engineers in the 1960s were building freeways they were being celebrated by architectural writers like Reiner Banham as this new sort of vernacular experience of space in the city of LA, but in fact they're driving over a kind of three dimensional bank crime uh, tool, a burglary tool, um, that was the size and shape of the city's freeway system. Um, I think that kind of thing is quite fascinating. And now, of course, that's the freeways, but now let's go under the surface of the earth into the storm uh, water networks. So at the height of all this bank crime in 1986, um, and this is one of my favorite stories in the book, um, there, was an, uh, there was a still unsolved crime um, that became known as the Hole in the Ground Gang. And so there's a bank that um, you can, I think one of these, there's a laser pointer somewhere here. but. Um, so in this map, uh, actually, okay, this isn't going to work. So um, if you look to the right, that's actually looking north. And so those are the Hollywood Hills draining south down into the city. Um, and uh, amidst all of that, at the corner of Sunset and Spalding, um, there was a bank. Uh, it's now a talent agency. But uh, at, over the course of um, May and June of, of, of 1986, the bank employees began to notice all these strange things occurring. Um, they started noticing weird electrical effects. Uh, the telephone systems would short in and out. Uh, the lights would turn on and off. Um, the music would turn on at really odd moments. Um, they'd hear sounds that would then go away. They would call the police and say, there's something happening in the bank. Like, could you please come sort it out? Um, but they would inspect the vault. Uh, alarms would go off, uh, but nothing was happening. There's no one in the vault. There's no evidence of, of, of tampering. Um, and so the police dismissed it as a large rat. Um, but uh, the bank employees began to think of it uh, as, a, as a poltergeist, um, which I think is interesting for at least two reasons. One, which, uh, which is that it was still only two or three years after the movie Poltergeist came out. Um, but also, I love the fact that it, it, was, it seemed more believable to them that the bank would be haunted by the supernatural figure than that there might be burglars trying to get in from below, which touches back again and again on that notion that burglars are almost these supernatural presences in the, in the, in the built environment. Um, so what was actually happening was that uh, a crew of individuals who are assumed in retrospect to have mid men, um, burglary and bank crime is a, is a relatively, not universally, but a, a, a relatively firmly gendered uh, undertaking. Um, but it, the, their knowledge of the storm sewer network uh, by following the old streams that came down out of the Hollywood Hills that would then drain down through the old valleys of Los Angeles, they're now, they've now been culverted and canalized and turned into the tunnel networks that extend for miles and miles in this labyrinth beneath the city, uh, eventually go all the way down, in this case, to Bayona Creek. Uh, and then Bayona Creek then drains down into the, uh, or, excuse me, the Pacific Ocean. Um, they knew this, the series of storm sewers so well, and you can see in these, in these really beautiful schematic diagrams that are available on the internet, if you, if you have nefarious um, things in mind. But uh, they, they knew it so well that one of the FBI theories actually was that the, the team might have been disgruntled water and power employees, um, that their knowledge of the city was such that they would just decided to, to put it to more lucrative use, so to speak, and take advantage of the fact that they knew that A, in Los Angeles, A is connected to B through this sort of filigree of tunnels that we don't see or even necessarily think about. And that if you control the, the sewers, you can effectively get, um, you can control the banks from below. 
So what was happening was that they were driving a, a, a group of Suzuki four-wheelers, um, <laughs> which are really no narrower than the actual tunnels themselves. So you've got these individuals hunched over Suzuki four-wheelers driving into the darkness of Los Angeles uh, night after night after night for, I think it was about three or four weeks while they were building a side tunnel. And so um, you can see in this photograph, uh, which is actually a, a photograph of a photograph, um, which was uh, shown to me by a retired FBI agent named William J. Rader, um, who's a really great guy who um, I really enjoyed meeting, but also his, his claim to fame, um, sorry, was that he was, he, was, he was the guy who was shadowed by Keanu Reeves when they made the movie Point Break. <laughs> and so Keanu Reeves and Bill Rader spent a couple weeks together uh, fighting crime in Los Angeles, um, but Bill um, mem memorably pointed out that Keanu never asked any questions, and, not, and none of the things that Bill Rader told him about fighting bank crime made it into the movie Point Break. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a yeah, it's nom nominative determinism at work. Um, but so so Raider uh, uh, met met with actually my wife and I at a the uh, at a at a cafe near the Santa Monica Airport, which is also interesting because that that's a, there's a scene in Point Break set at the Santa Monica Airport. Um, but in any case, he had these files and these photographs. And um, so what these guys have been doing is they 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 drove into and they kind of set up a, a drilling camp underneath the surface of Los Angeles, and they began tunneling a block about a block and a half, two blocks east uh, to go underneath this, this bank. Um, and so they were very, very good at tunneling. And so the second theory that the FBI came up with was that they were so good at tunneling that they might actually have been disgruntled mining engineers. <laughs> and so they had you know, come down from the mountains of the Sierra uh, you know, with this sort of battle-hardened vision of the Earth's uh, <laughs> subsurface. Uh, and they decided to put that to use, digging tunnels and robbing banks. Um, so it was a very, very good tunnel. They didn't use any reinforcement. Uh, and in fact, it was quite a clever um, design. They had some improvisational hydrological engineering as well, because um, in order to get rid of all that debris, which is an awful lot of uh, you know, excess rock and sand and that kind of thing, um, they would build up a little dam inside the stormwater sewer um, network, excuse me, so that as even a trickle of water came down out of the Hollywood Hills, it would build up you know, inch by inch by inch and form a small reservoir um, under the city that they, they would then knock out all of that water would then flow through the tunnel. It would wash away all the debris. It would wash away their footprints. It would wash away sticks of gum, DNA evidence, whatever it is that they might, might otherwise have had, and kind of clean the, the, the crime scene afresh um, every few nights. The other really clever thing they were doing, however, was that they were attaching their industrial tools to the bank's own electrical <coughs> network. And so like a kind of electrical jellyfish, they were tapping up into the dangling wires and cables that, that controlled the bank, which is, of course, in retrospect, that makes sense of why the bank employees were hearing Muzak at 9 o'clock at night, why the telephones are shorting out. It was not a poltergeist. It was the bank people, or the, uh, the, the hole in the ground gang splicing in from below. Um, but so once they actually got into the bank, um, you know, they, 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 they chose a three-day weekend, which is kind of a cliche of heist films, but is actually a, a, a great time to break into banks. You have more time. Um, they had set off the alarm so many times that the police didn't take it seriously. So even though they set off the vault alarm and the bank alarm was going off most of the weekend, nobody came. Uh, it was just it was that bank up on sunset again. It was the bank that cried wolf. And so they had three entire days. Um, here's their actual tunnel. Um, it almost looks like something out of Cappadocia. And, um, and they got away with it. Um, so I could go at, into this at much greater length, but I'll mention briefly that they came back uh, a year later, and this is the, even these crimes are still unsolved. Um, they came back in uh, the summer of 1987, and they started tunneling into a bank, if you know LA, at the corner of Pico and La Cienega. And so um, they got even better at tunneling in this case, and so they uh, didn't set off any alarms. Um, and so, of course, their expertise uh, their, that they had net, were now applying uh, worked against them because now, finally, when they did get into the vault, they set off the vault alarm and the police immediately swarmed the bank. Um, so as the bank was you know, uh, being locked down from above, they were fleeing below. They crawled back into their tunnels, they got back on those Suzuki four-wheelers, and they fled off into the darkness. Um, what's pretty incredible is that their getaway route was an entirely subterranean uh, journey beneath the streets of Los Angeles of uh, multiple miles. Uh, they ended up getting down all the way to the Bayona Creek where they abandoned their Suzuki four-wheelers. Uh, but again, that knowledge of the city, the fact that they didn't take any wrong turns, they didn't get lost, they didn't choose a tunnel that was ever narrowing, um, they didn't hit a grate, or not a grate, excuse me, a gate that had been locked uh, to prevent them from passing. Um, they clearly knew what they were doing. Um, they had a knowledge of the city, like Jack Daxwin's knowledge of the fire code of Toronto, uh, and they were able to get away. 
Um, Bill Rader joked that if, uh, it's now beyond the statute of limitations, and so even if they were to show up at LAPD headquarters or at the FBI um, LA headquarters tomorrow and say, this is how we did it, these are the photographs of us doing it, this is us spending the money, um, they, could, they couldn't be arrested. Um, all they could do is buy them a steak and a martini. Um, there are many more things to, that I could discuss there, but I want to continue down this track of what it means to be speaking with the FBI and with law enforcement about burglary. Um, it, it was, of course, it was rhetorically interesting to figure out how to do that um, while researching a book about burglary. Um, you know, telling the police in, in an enthusiastic manner that I wanted to learn how to get away from police helicopters <laughs> or, you know, what, what, what might make a perfect bank crime um, was something I, I quickly learned to phrase those questions and statements differently. Um, but what was fascinating about speaking with um, the FBI in particular was that these tools, in the same way that you can take something from one field, like a street cleaning bristle, and turn it into a lockpick, you can take something like fire code and turn it into a targeting mechanism, you can take burglary itself and turn it into a method that law enforcement will use. And so the FBI actually are, are one of many federal agencies that have, have over time basically turned into burglars extraordinaire. Um, in order to get a, uh, like a, oh, and these are uh, files, in fact, that have been FOIA'd and are available on the FBI website um, from a group that they call Surreptitious Entries or their Tactical Operations Squad. And so these are, de well, I shouldn't say detailed, they're heavily redacted um, <laughs> files uh, of uh, different um, operations to put mics and um, surveillance equipment inside the homes or offices of people connected to the mob or of drug traffickers or of other people that the FBI might be targeting, including political dissidents, and uh, figuring out ways to get into buildings. Um, so I, I'll, there are just two things I want to mention here. Um, there are obviously things that we could discuss in terms of the politics of this, um, what it means to have federal burglary crews at work. Um, but I want to just mention two quick things in terms of the types of what they use for, for these kinds of things. So um, there's a group that was referred to as Operation Stagehand, which is a pretty accurate name for what they got up to. Um, but in order to disguise the federal breaking and entering, they would do everything from travel with vials and bags of dust, so that if they went into, a, let's say, a mob boss's home and they put a, 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 a wire tap, or not a wire tap, but a microphone in, the, in a light fixture, and then they inadvertently brushed some dust off of a lamp shade or off of the top of a stereo, they would then take out their vial of dust and almost like a kind of Harry Potter figure, they would just sprinkle dust on whatever they had left behind. Um, they even uh, had uh, an example that I think was great, which was that they'll disguise one another's activities uh, so that you can, someone else can break into a building while everyone else is kind of running um, uh, you know, camouflage out on the street. And so they actually had pop-up shrubbery um, that were attached to umbrella opening mechanisms. <laughs> And so someone could sit down and lockpick their way into a warehouse while miraculously a whole series of plants would just appear, uh, which were these pop-up uh, umbrella-based um, artificial shrubbery that, that would be used to disguise the FBI's undertakings. In any case, um, following on this, um, this train of thought, the, it, when I went into this, I was thinking things like lockpicking that there was a very subtle approach to the tools of breaking and entering, and that there was a kind of um, way to finesse your way into architecture, that there was uh, almost this, um, this handheld artis artisanal um, <laughs> beauty of, of getting into locked spaces. Um, but what's interesting about burglary and about breaking and entering and about forced entry is that, in fact, the true tools of burglary, of super burglary, the tr the, the, and even, even what the hole in the ground gang used, to get into the bank itself, they used a concrete coring machine that you would use in construction, demolition, and, and, uh, uh, yeah, and sewer work. Um, these tools do exist, but they're under the controlled use of law enforcement agencies. Um, and so, and fire fighting personnel and that kind of thing. And so what really began to intrigue me, and that I, this was another rabbit hole that I went in, down while writing the book, was that, um, Exploring the, where these things are, who operates them, and who has access to them was something that was really fascinating. Um, so you've got things like fire departments uh, with uh, the, the torches to burn their way into buildings or axes to cut through um, you know, walls that you would think would otherwise um, keep anybody out. Um, you've got uh, pneumatic door spreaders, that, like the jaws of life that would be used to rescue you from a car accident, but yet can be used to spread the door jam of a house so that you can no longer physically close the door. 
Um, and I was able to spend a day with an ATF agent, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. These are, these are not my photographs. Um, but learning about the kinds of things that the ATF used to get into buildings and with rapid entry um, teams. And so one of the great uh, tools here is the burning bar. Um, you can see this being used. You can use it to take apart uh, entire pieces of industrial infrastructure. Uh, it was actually invented to help dismantle war material after World War I. So when you've got fields and fields full of destroyed tanks, uh, in order to take them apart, you've got this tool that burns so hot it can melt granite. Um, and now, of course, you can use it to get into bank vaults or to get through doors and locks of any kind. Um, but what was really interesting was learning, especially from an architectural point of view, was that um, they, they have this thing, and, and um, he, he, he referred to it as door school, um, which I thought was a great description. But so it looks almost like a kind of avant-garde art installation, because when you see door school, um, it is literally just doors in the middle of nowhere. So you have a meadow, and there'll be six doors next to one another, or it'll look like a basketball court, and there'll be a bunch of doors in it, um, like these TARDIS-like structures. Um, but then the teams will line up and they'll practice ways of breaching, is what, is what the term is, and they'll have ways of forcing their way through these different doors using different technologies. Um, but even here, though, you see these really great examples of, of reused technology from other fields. Um, so a couple examples that I really thought were interesting um, are that IV bags uh, filled with water. Um, water cannot compress, and so if you drive an explosion, explosion or a uh, force through water, it'll amplify the explosion. So just detonation cord and IV bags filled with water lined up on a door will amplify the detonation cord enough that you can blow the door off of its hinges effectively without using explosives. Um, another uh, example are actually airbags that you would have in a, in a vehicle um, have been repurposed so that you can attach airbags to doors and basically blow them off the hinges. Uh, to, in order to get in inside, um, there's one example that I'm that I'm tracking down that I'm that I'm excited to learn more about, um, but was a series of um, cash deposit robberies in Scandinavia using potatoes. Um, so potatoes, of course, are and this is not the actual t statistic, but they are, let's say, 85% water. Um, I, please don't quote me on that, but they are a high percentage of water, which means that they are an ideal um, explosive amplifier. And so if you fill up an, a, a, a cash deposit box uh, with potatoes that you need to blow from the inside out without uh, destroying everything else, you can then drop a relatively small explosion in, explosive in. It will be amplified by the potatoes, and it will blow the door off the hinge from the inside out. Um, so whoever figured that out um, you know, deserves some sort of um, potato medal. <laughs> but um, it's that kind of creativity and that kind of misuse of everyday objects that I think is, is, is both interesting but also points out the fact that the only thing keeping people out of your residence is the moral code of not entering and the legal punishment of whether or not they do so. It's physically possible to do this. You know, um, the military has ways to get into basically any type of structure in the world, whether it's a nuclear power plant, a bank vault, or obviously your own home. Um, I think it's quite sobering to realize that the tools exist to get into anything and that your protection is entirely dependent on following codes of recognition about where personal or private space begins and where the world of other people ends. But the final thing I want to talk about then is that if all of these tools are being developed, if things like burning bars exist, if things like um, the jaws of life are now being applied to architecture as opposed to car accidents, um, it seemed like only a matter of time before somebody would build architecture to resist these tools. And so I found myself actually speaking with this individual named Carl Alizad. And so Carl was a really fascinating um, individual. He uh, owns a place called, a business called CitySafe. Um, it's in a warehouse in rural New Jersey. It's about an hour and a half south of Manhattan. And uh, as you pull up to this place, it was quite funny that there was a, a ruined safe out in the front yard, almost as a a uh, reminder either to himself or to other people that basically some, everything can be uh, broken into or violated. But so Carl was a retired um, New Jersey uh, state police officer who, while working um, as a cop, was really struck by the emotional impact of burglary, um, something that uh, prior to now ha I, I have not mentioned. 
Um, but for him, seeing what happens to people after they've been burglarized, after someone has violated their, their sense of space and security, uh, when somebody comes in and whether, they, whether or not they steal something of value to them or simply um, break and enter and, and, and reveal that somebody has been inside um, their, their, their house, was so emotionally traumatic that it was something that he effectively wanted to devote the rest of his life to, to finding a way to create an absolutely impermeable barrier to make sure that breaking and entering could in fact physically be stopped. And so um, while working with, uh, he's also an insurance investigator for Lloyd's of London, so um, the warehouse, you can, you can only make out, uh, yeah, you can't really see this actually in the background here, but um, behind that curtain in that you can see in the photograph, um, one of the things that was fascinating about this place was that he gets shipped um, pieces of safes, but also whole chunks of wall that have been cut through uh, at, um, say, uh, like gold depositories or um, banks or even private homes. So if you're familiar with the work of Gordon Mata Clark, the American um, artist, the, the entire warehouse had this strange feeling of being in a Gordon Mata Clark installation in that there were fragments of walls with holes cut through them. Um, there were pieces of objects that had been cut in half and they were on display almost as uh, the forensic evidence of, of crimes that had happened in the past. But so Carl got really obsessed with this. And he started experimenting with a whole range of things, including a proprietary concrete mix that, that uh, he wouldn't go into the, the ingredients of uh, when speaking with me, uh, and a series of bolt-together um, modular panels. They're about two feet by two feet uh, and can be built up to any size, um, as, as, as uh, you'll see in, in uh, one of the forthcoming slides. Um, so this is the interior view where it can only be bolted from the inside. But so what Carl's calculation was at the time was really interesting. Um, in, in the early 2000s in particular, the, the bad guys, so to speak, the tools that he was protecting against were tools that were the discarded military remnants of the former Soviet Union. And so you've got Kalashnikovs, AK-47s, you've got Russian rocket propelled grenades, you've got all kinds of Russian military weaponry that flooded the market after the Soviet Union fell apart, and those were the, the, the tools that ended up in the hands of the um, terrorist armies, uh, uh, criminal gangs, and, and, and the kinds of things that were being confronted, in Carl's imagination at least, uh, by the people who might want to, to, to purchase a, a safe room or a panic room, which is what, this, which is what the, the, the structure is that you're looking at. Um, it is really interesting just to point out that it, that calculation is different now, especially after the, the debacle of the US occupation in Iraq. It is now US weaponry that has flooded um, so many of these overseas places where we are now, and you could argue that Carl's things are protecting against the wrong weapons now. But so he's ethnically Russian and he would actually ship these, these uh, panels all over to a Russian air base where they would be tested against Kalashnikovs, against 50 uh, caliber sniper rifles, against rocket propelled grenades. And, um, and uh, I love the example as well of even of uh, C4 explosives, uh, which are the same kind of things that you would use to bring down skyscrapers and uh, sports stadiums. Um, but even those can't take apart the panic rooms of, of Carl Alizad. And so I really like this notion that in, um, and these are the kind of configurations that they can be built into, but that someone would have such a moral repugnance at the possibility of burglary and at the notion of trying to keep people from one space out of the next, out of the next uh, room adjacent to it, that Carl has effectively inadvertently created this architecture that will outlast everything. Um, you know, that as, uh, you know, skyscrapers will fall, um, the banks of the world will crumble to dust, the pyramids will long since have been eroded, but there will be these undemolishable panic rooms hou housed uh, or, you know, filled with uh, the skeletons of the ultra-rich <laughs> lasting well into the, the distant future. So I love the notion that human security in this case then, the, the quest to prevent burglary, um, could actually be the last thing that, that, that survives of human civilization on Earth. And in fact, actually, the thing that Otto was drawing um, was one of the patent diagrams for Carl um, when he figured out how to make the, uh, the panelized panic room. And so this thing, you can bolt it together into just a safe, as you can see here, or you can literally, as if playing Minecraft, um, you can make this thing, uh, it, there's, there's no, uh, you know, if you're a billionaire, there's no limit to what you could actually build with these things. You can go as high as you want, as long as you want, and you can build uh, just these, these infinite labyrinths of fortification. Um, I think I'm actually going to leave it at that um, with those stories, and then um, I'd love to, if there are questions, to talk about any other aspects of, of burglary, whether it's technical, moral, legal, or architectural. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Um, there's going to be a mic going around, so uh, and Michael has it, so I'll, I'll 
take the liberty of the first question, but if you do have a question, raise your hand and, uh, and, and a mic will get to you. And that way the people listening on the live stream and our video will actually hear those questions. Um, so, I mean, the, the most fascinating thing to me about infrastructure is it's kind of the longest thing that humans do in the built environment. That, that you know, the sewage system, the, the electrical system underneath that, the, the buildings that we live in are often thought of as at least century-long investments by the people who are building them, but it was the, it's the burglars that are looking at them from a, a whole different point of view. Um, and this point of view of fundamentally of time and then and there's two sides of the time right there was the time of how long it takes to get in mm -hmm. and then there was the question of whether or not they could get out and I you yeah. you open the book with a great story of the the Leslie gang oh. um, and uh, and one of their crimes and particularly what they did to the night watchman which I thought you might uh, sure, yeah. recall here um, uh, yeah, uh, some really quick background. That, yeah, the, uh, the book opens with the story of a man named George Leonidas Leslie, um, who, for me at least, really sums up the relationship between burglary and architecture. Uh, he was trained as an architect. Um, he moved to New York City in the 1860s, so immediately following the Civil War. Um, it was a really great time to be an architect in New York, in fact. It was the beginning of the Gilded Age. Uh, super mansions were popping up on along Fifth Avenue. Um, financial institutions were moving to the city. You know, he, and he was a pretty talented individual. Um, but instead of hopping aboard, and designing um, you know, the, the, the next uh, art museum of, for, for New York, he decided to use his architectural skills to become um, the, the most prolific bank robber of the 19th century. Um, his gang was, was behind 80%, 80% of all the bank crime in the United States at the time. Um, but so he would do things like build duplicate vaults. He would do the kinds of things that have now become Hollywood cliches. Um, so he would use his photographic memory to um, remember the layout of vaults, and then he would build them again in a, in a series of warehouses over in Brooklyn um, so that his crew could then train on these surrogates and um, get it down to the point where they could actually turn out the lights and they could do it in the dark without even bumping into chairs and that kind of thing. So they would practice on a microcosm of the thing that they were about to assault. Um, but so their cleverness didn't extend just to architecture. Um, they, they did at least two things I'll, I'll mention. One was that they broke into the Metropolitan Opera and they stole all costumes. <laughs> and so they, would use, they used costumes and opera props to, as part of their way of hiding their bank crimes. And so they would unfold like a, the, the screen that would hide an actor who's awaiting his or her cue to go on stage. They would use that to hide lock picking operations, that kind of thing. But then at one point, they actually um, were in a town. Um, I believe this was in, in uh, Massachusetts. But they went in and they uh, went to the night watchman's house. They tied up the entire family. Um, and then the, the detail was that they then went around in the house and they stopped all of the clocks. And so they did that so that when the night, the, the, they would have no idea how long they'd been tied up. Um, they wouldn't be able to give the police any sense of, oh, they left three hours ago or four hours ago or 15 minutes ago. Obviously, they could have counted the entire time, but something tells me the, the panic would have, of, would have prevented that. But I love that notion that they almost uh, you know, introduced this like Caesura in time and um, took the night watchman out of the present moment or into an infinite present moment where he didn't know how much time had passed. And in that gap was the was the was the bank robbery itself. Right. The time bandits, as it were. Yeah. The um, yeah, and and this I think what's also an undercurrent here that you know the built environment is also a product of um, of codes and of our social uh, contract, and um, and that fundamentally all of these best uh, burglars, especially these guys that never got caught, they were social engineers as much as yeah. they were anything else. There were people who understood mining systems. They understood. Uh, fire codes they understood. Um, and in the case of the Leslie gang, he would just go and like talk to them like an architect and often get their plans just handed to them yeah. um, uh, that he would use against them. Um, do we have a question? Um, I was thinking about the sort of most recent incarnation of your bank robbers being sort of hackers um, on the internet and whether you've seen much sort of overlap between the infiltration of physical spaces and, and digital ones and the sort of psychology behind that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that question comes up a lot in terms of w what is happening, what is burglary's relationship to hacking and to digital bank crime and identity theft, but also what wither burglary, so to speak. Um, it, uh, legally speaking, it's not burglary. And so one of the things I wanted to do with the book was specifically focus on an analog relationship to architecture. So you would have to physically enter a space, not just you know, hack in and take somebody's um, uh, passcode or, or drain their bank account. Um, but it is interesting. I think, I think the two things that interest me there are the extent to which we spatialize information through metaphors so that it sounds as if we are hacking into a computer. 
Um, are you in someone's bank accounts? And is that actually a useful spatial metaphor to use? Um, I think that that's something that comes out of basically just the rhetorics of data space, so to speak, and whether or not we can apply burglary as a crime to it. And as, as of now, we can't. So it, it is not considered burglary. Um, but it is interesting, though, that digital crime is so easy now and, and draining bank accounts and ATM skimming and um, other forms of instantaneous uh, digital crime that burglary is way down. So in New York City, for example, where I live, it's down 81%, I think, since the 1980s uh, to the present day. I mean, which is in effect, that's an endangered crime. You know, it doesn't, it really doesn't happen very often. <laughs> and um, actually, Jack Daxman, the, the individual I mentioned in Toronto, um, had a pretty interest, interestingly melancholic attitude towards this, which was that when he started burglarizing, burglaring, um, burgling, uh, you know, he felt like he was part of a community of people who were kind of almost like urban explorers who were rethinking the built environment. And now, though, it's as if he's the, and it's one of the reasons why he stopped. He's just like, he was, he was, the, he was the Omega Man. You know, there was, there was nobody else around. There's no one else to talk to about this. Uh, it felt like a dying, sort of pointless activity. And so he went into... Uh, um, the, the security field. But so in any case, yeah, the, the, uh, it's, it's not burglary, and, but it, it will be interesting to see how and if legal theory comes around to look at hacking as some kind of spatialized activity, because at the moment it's not, and I feel like it shouldn't be. I mean, it's not actually spatial. That's just a metaphor. And the, now, now the, I feel the, bad so these burglars. <laughs> the social engineering aspect sometimes crosses this line. Um, you know, a, a lot of people um, that uh, we, we mutually, mutually know do uh, physical security and penetration tests and, and often their parlor trick when they're at a company that they're doing work for is they'll walk up to the nearest desk and start flipping over mouse pads and keyboards and like, okay, well, there's this person's key. There's, their password is written right there and this, this person's password is written right here. So often people will use physical means to get to the virtual means um, or social engineering, which crosses both of these fields. Mike, over here. Thank you. That's, uh, that's a fascinating way of looking at sure. things. And I, I'm interested in the value that people are putting on that time and space. So these guys in LA clearly put mm -hmm. a lot of time and effort and thought in doing that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that cost, how they might do that cost analysis against how much do they actually take from that bank after all that time. Did it? Did they break even? Was it the social gratification we got away? Yeah. Were there additional crimes besides the one that they, they bailed on yeah. that that crew may have been part of? Well, I mean, that's a good, that's a good, it's a good question. It's the, uh, because they haven't been identified, it's, in, it's impossible to answer many of those. But it is interesting, though, to look at a couple things. One is um, the nature of safe deposit robberies in general, which is what it, it was at the, in the end. They robbed the safe deposit boxes. Um, it, that's this really nebulous and strange world, actually, because people will simultaneously overclaim what they have in a safe deposit box in order to get insurance on things that aren't actually there, or they will underclaim because they actually have things in their safe deposit box, but they don't want to legally admit to it, or for that matter, for p personal and family reasons, they don't want to admit that they had something. And so it's actually really difficult to calculate exactly what is stolen in any of these uh, cases. Um, one detail I, I should mention, actually, was that, um, which is, I find strangely endearing, um, was that they were so good at tunneling, and they were really good at the city. They knew the city from, you know, from the downside up. Um, but they were really bad at bank robbing, actually. So one of the things that they did that was funny was that you know, if you're robbing safe deposit boxes, um, there is obviously a way to get into safe deposit boxes, either through the locks themselves or through the hinges, um, that just allows you to slide the whole thing out and then do the one above it and the one below it, et cetera. But the way they did it was through brute force prying of the doors, which meant that for every one they opened, they prevented, they physically blocked themselves from getting into the one above it to the right, to the left, and below, which meant for every one they robbed, there were four that they couldn't rob. Um, so that's a really bad ratio, and it implies that they were just so excited at the, what they knew about the city and what they knew they could do in the earth that they just went ahead and did it and, um, and didn't get away with all the stuff that they could have gotten. But, so, but yeah, that's the question, though. You know, I mean, it's, it's what, what is the, why do people do this kind of thing? And I think that you know, it often comes up when, when, when I talk about the book that there's a risk of romanticizing burglars in particular because it's really fun to talk about. Um, but what is the romance? You know, because you see it, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't start with a burglar's guide to the city. Like you see it in even just the, the you know, George Clooney in Ocean's Eleven or Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief. This, or, or the, 
you know, or James Bond and, and, and whatnot, but that suave, um, you know, the, the, the figure who, who, is, who, is, who, can, who can walk into any, any bank or enemy lair and, and, and get what they want. Um, where, where does that romanticization come from? And I guess it, I, my, my quick answer to that is that it, I, it, to, it feels as if architecture is and always has been a three-dimensional puzzle, but because of morals and legal consequences, we refuse to look at it that way. Or at least I, you know, speaking again for myself, it's really easy to avoid realizing that almost as if we live in a world of three-dimensional Sudoku or a crossword puzzle or a Django puzzle that we, that, that we, can, that we can solve differently, um, burglars come along and they find a different way to get from one room to the next, to get from one building to the next. And they reveal that all along there was this shortcut, almost like you know, entering a, a, a code into a Nintendo game and suddenly having all the, all the powers. Like they figured out a way to short circuit the entire world. And there's something really strange and magical about that, let alone the kind of appeal of instant riches. Um, but I think that that's one of the reasons why this kind of thing seems to have like an, a, a romantic appeal. And by way of coming back to your question, is why people invest so much time in it. You know, let's pretend that San Francisco is a puzzle. Now let's solve that puzzle tonight. And we can find things using storm sewer networks and docks and, and waiting for the fog to roll in. And there's all kinds of things we can do, and it's fun. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why people do it, not because they, they're going to end up with millions of dollars, which incidentally, they often can't spend anyway because they have it all in cash and they'll be screwed if they do it. So um, because of the way that cash is regulated, controlled, and, or notated in, in banks. So it's a really dubious and kind of stupid crime to commit. I'd suggest liberty. The, the bank. Of liberty. The oh, oh, sure. Yeah, and we had in our uh, in our other speaking series the group from Paris that um, yeah. that broke into um, kind of historical buildings and repaired them yeah. uh, for the for the government. They repaired. They spent months repairing this clock, and then you know called them up, called up the city one morning and said, you know, your clock that you that's been broken for 400 years has now been fixed. Um, and so they would they would kind of break in to do deeds of good, which I think leads you more to the. Um, the part of the romanticism and, you know, they were doing it to do it, but also to unlock the city in a, in yeah. a new way. Yeah. Any, do we have another question? Yeah. Yep. You mentioned urban explorers briefly. Um, mm -hmm. The group I was involved with in Minneapolis, at one point, some of my friends broke into a construction trailer, uh, stole the map of all of the storm sewers for the entire city, took it to Kinko's, scanned it, made a bunch of CDs, and then went and broke back into the construction trailer again to put it back. Uh, doing this all in like four hours over the course of the night. I guess yeah. my question is like why, you know, clearly urban explorers don't have the moral code of not going into places that they're not supposed to be. So why don't you think there are more yeah. uh, explorers who are burglars? Uh, and or do you think there are explorers who are burglars and they're just so good at it that nobody knows about it? Uh, it's, it's actually a surprisingly tricky question um, because well, from, if I was a police officer, I would say that many of those explorers are burglars because of the intention to do whatever it is that they might be doing down there, whether it might be um, photographing on public property, uh, they might be engaged in other forms of activity that might involve you know, whatever it is that they might have brought along with them. They might have things that can be constituted as weapons. They might have drug paraphernalia. There are many things that a, a law enforcement individual could say, well, they are committing burglary. Because remember, burglary is not theft. Um, but that's, that's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. At one point, there was going to be an entire part of the book that was about urban exploration and its relationship, its conceptual relationship with burglary. Um, but through speaking with people in the ur urban exploration world, it just seemed to be, the, uh, the analogy I kind of use is that it's almost like, um, and this came up with lock picking as well, it's like looking around for heavy metal fans and then asking them all about what it feels to be a Satanist or how, how does it feel to, you know, to, to have no, um, yeah, moral, moral code in, in, in terms of religion, which in, in other words is a ridiculous question to ask and pin, pigeonholes people based on something that they do uh, on the expected illegality of it. But so I didn't want to write the, a chapter that would look at urban exploration in terms of burglary because I don't think that a kind of joyous exploration of publicly funded infrastructure should necessarily be criminalized in that way. Um, I do think more people would very easily and definitely be urban explorers if there wasn't the perceived legal risk of doing so. So when there is a gate that's closed, the question shouldn't be, can we, should we, or it, amongst, the, the, one of the, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily be the first question to ask whether or not someone has the legal right to be on the other side of that door, but why is that door there in the first place? Like what is preventing us from performative ownership of things we fund 
and, and enjoy as the infrastructure of modern society. So those are tunnels, those are bridges, those are um, the back rooms of, of buildings and that kind of thing. And so it's a pretty complex question, I think, in terms of the moral aspect of it. Um, but I do think that that's one of the things you do see happening as well now is that urban exploration is being treated more and more as burglary. It's being treated as a form of uh, pretty aggressive trespassing and it's being cracked down upon, especially in terms of the notion that you know we have no idea. Maybe these are people from ISIS and they're they're gonna you know they're gonna pull a uh, you know they're gonna blow up the houses of parliament from the from a disused subway station in London or you know I mean just you know whatever it might be um, you know so if people look at you suspiciously if you photograph you know a police station imagine what would happen if they found you underneath that police station with uh, with with maps to the whole city um, and so. I think that's the problem, is really just the, the infrastructure is not seen as, a, as, as public space. And, and there are times where it, that's right, and there are times where that's not right. Uh, last question. So we have a question from the live chat. Um, and first, they wanted to mention that uh, here in San Francisco, and thanks everybody who's listening on the live stream, or watching on the live stream, um, there's a B-side security conference at the BNA Lounge here in town, uh, and yesterday apparently they mentioned they were talking about lockpicks, uh, and actually included lockpicks in the badge for the conference. Um, so that's I think still going on right now or, uh, across town. Um, but the the question they want to ask to further the digital physical comparison um, beyond ATM skimming. We're wondering if you've found any stories about burglars physically stealing or removing ATMs, uh, and sure, is, yeah. is that another whole chapter that, 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 that could exist? Um, it is. I mean, again, uh, the, the funny thing, in the, and this, this might sound anticlimactic, but is that depending on where the ATM is, it wouldn't be burglary. So you would, if, you, if you never go into an architectural space, and if you haven't broken a close or gone under an awning or gone into a, any sort of roofed or walled structure, um, that would be any number of other things like vandalism and larceny and, and other f federal crimes for stealing mon uh, monetary instruments. But it wouldn't necessarily be burglary. But in any case, um, y yes, you do see that kind of thing. Yeah, entire ATMs get stolen. I mean, you see, you see it literally in movie and TV shows like Breaking Bad. Uh, but that does happen. Um, there are examples, um, including in Europe, of uh, using explosives to blow ATM fronts off and uh, steal cash or the entire machine. Um, the example I used with the potatoes was a variant on that in the sense that they were blowing from the inside out uh, cash deposit boxes, and um, you could easily do that to an ATM. Um, but you're also seeing in the hardening of bank structures as well, um, you're seeing criminals turn to other modes of getting cash easier. And so why on earth would you break into the vault when you can just rip the ATM off you know, with some chains and a pickup truck? And, uh, and get the cash out of it. So you are seeing that the only thing is just, yeah, it's just, it just isn't necessarily technically burglary. So, so just to finish a, a, a follow up on that, so there's a range, as you talked about from the start, from sort of Darwin Awards attempts to you know, sophisticated things. Would you say there's an overall net kind of evolutionary progress that's happening, or do the same stupid mistakes uh, how, how would you characterize the evolution if it's happening of, of those burglary techniques? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'd say that it's, you know, I don't know if there's, there's got to be a word from e e e ecology for this, but the, as the, excuse me, as the, as the techniques of burglary evolve, so do the techniques of, of defense. And so there's a, there's a yeah, it's a, there's a stasis. But uh, yeah, it's an arms war between one side and the other. Um, but yeah, you do see really sophisticated things emerging, but at the same time then, if somebody then, all, they all move to a different type of material that you can no longer use a cutting torch on, or they all go to a different type of lock that you can no longer use certain tools to, of, of access for, then they're just gonna move to something else. And so that, the line of evolution will, will end. Um, but the stupidity doesn't go away. Uh, you know. <laughs> and so. And I, and I think you mentioned yeah. this, that, that most crimes are not the Leslie gang building replicas of banks in, sure. in, in warehouses. They're, most crimes are kind of jackasses yeah. grabbing an opportunity, right? So yeah. this is, we're talking about a rarity of the successful ones. Definitely, yeah, I mean, it's the overwhelming majority are, are either crimes of opportunity or, or ill-considered. I mean, just, a, just maybe the final example, because I, I really like the story, um, was one where it sounded like the guy had, you know, he, he had the, this, this individual in Oregon had a brainwave and he realized that you know everybody's targeting banks and financial institutions, but what about a natural history museum? 
you know, it's got gold, it's got gemstones, it's got all kinds of really rich mineral wealth, and, and they're not exactly expecting, you know, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible to break in. So he had a really great insight, but then what he did was that, uh, and it, which is hilarious, was that he dressed up in a ghillie suit. And so a ghillie suit is uh, something that a military sniper will wear in order to blend in with plant life. And so it makes you look like a fern or, or uh, some sort of shrubbery that you might find on a hillside. And so while dressed like a plant, he robbed a museum of rocks and minerals, uh, which is po possibly the worst camouflage he could have chosen. And, and, and was arrested inside the museum and also has a legendary uh, um, uh, mugshot because he's, still, uh, he's still fully dressed like a plant. But, um, so yeah, the, you, get, you get the good with the bad, I guess you could say. But, yeah. Well, uh, as all speakers, I'd like to give you uh, one of our Long Now Challenge coins. Thank you very oh, cool. much. Thank you. Uh, and yes, thank you. Uh, another round of applause for Jeff, please.